Hey there, I'm Alex. This is Big Al Books, and today I'm here to do my April wrap up. I made it through 10 books this month, and I want to start this video off with a disclaimer that I know that it is very important to read diversely, but I completely failed at that this month, and 8 of the 10 books that I read are written by dead white guys. So I'm going to try to do better in May, but you know, sometimes you just fall off the horse of trying to be progressive with your reading, and you just go backwards and just want to read Western canon classics, and that's kind of what happened to me this month. So I'm sorry, but that's just the way that it worked out. So um, the two books that I read that weren't written by dead white guys, uh, the first was Even This Page is White by Vivek Shraya, which is a Canadian poetry collection. And I felt like that was a good antidote to all of the dead white guy stuff that I was reading because this book, as you can assume from the title, is all about dismantling our perceptions of race and it asked a lot of challenging and provoking questions. So I think if you were approaching this text as a person of color, I think you'd find a lot to identify with. Shreya writes about a lot of the kind of everyday difficulties of being a person of color and there was one uh, particularly powerful poem called A Dog Named Lavender and it kept asking the question, what would I be thinking about if I weren't thinking about this? And it's kind of that idea that so much mental energy has to go into thinking about race when white people can go on and kind of not have to tackle those big questions in their day-to-day -day life and are kind of just free to just do what they want. So that poem was very heavy hitting. I was approaching this text as a white reader and it provided me with a really excellent opportunity to examine my own privilege, which is something that it's necessary to do even if it can be a little uncomfortable to think about the ways that you might benefit from oppression. But Shreya writes these poems that not only allow you to empathize with people of color, but she demands that white readers need to take action. And she tells us that being an ally is not simply it's just not enough. You need to be doing more in your everyday life to help dismantle these forms of oppression. And for people with privilege, a lot of times that takes the form of giving things up. So giving up time or space, money or resources. So that was a really interesting point and got me thinking about tangible things that I can do in my everyday life to make way for change. So as you can see, there are a lot of powerful ideas in this collection of poetry. I didn't always enjoy the style that these poems were written in. I thought they were kind of these Tumblr friendly little paragraphs with all the letters in lowercase, but even if I didn't always enjoy the style or the delivery of these poems, they had such important ideas. I wrote down so many lines and considering it's such a short collection, this is something that I think everyone should check out. I also read a play called Dead White Writer on the Floor by Drew Hayden Taylor. He's an Anishinaabe author who's built his reputation on being a playwright and I've only ever read his novels and nonfiction before. So I was glad to get around to one of his plays, but unfortunately I didn't like it very much. It had a good premise though. At the start of the play, we are in a room with six characters who all happen to be famous aboriginal stereotypes basically. So you have Pocahontas and you have Tonto and you've got this warrior figure. So these are all kind of the stereotypes that you see about aboriginal people in pop culture and like movies and stuff. So they're all in this room and there's a dead white writer on the floor and they need to figure out, you know, who killed him and why he's dead. I think this play ultimately failed for me because while it can be fun to play around with stereotypes, you have to be able able to build a character that is stronger than the stereotype. You need to show the ways that these stereotypes are really harmful for the characters. And I don't think that Drew was able to create successful or convincing characters that moved beyond these stereotypes. So unfortunately, this play had a good premise, but not a great execution. Another play I got around to reading this month was Hamlet by William Shakespeare and I was able to go to my first production of this play and I'm so glad that I read this beforehand because I felt like I could really get 
the most out of that production. I really knew what was going on and I just really enjoyed it. I can say that the best thing about the production I saw, it was put on by a group called Why Not Theater in Toronto. And they were such a diverse theater company. So I loved it. The cast was just diverse in so many ways. There were people from all sorts of different racial backgrounds, which exactly reflects what Toronto is like as well. The cast were people of all ages and they played around with the gender casting. So Hamlet was played by a female actress and Ophelia was played by a male actor. And I really liked that because I think the old you know, woman in a white dress mad scene with Ophelia can get a little tiring. So it was kind of interesting to see the character from a different angle. As well, the actress who played Horatio was a woman who was deaf, so she was on stage doing sign language throughout the whole play. So it was just very nice to be seeing Shakespeare in such an inclusive setting because I think that Shakespeare can be off-putting for a lot of people and it's kind of deemed uh, like stuffy and for a certain audience. And I really think that this production dismantled a lot of those ideas and it was just a very intimate performance in a small space and I just really enjoyed watching the drama unfold so I definitely had a great time I love reading it it's so good and I can't wait to see it again I also got around to reading some classics by authors I've never read before, so I read Buddenbrooks by Thomas Mann and Père Goriot by Honoré de Balzac. So I've done review videos for both of these books, so if you want to hear more about them, I'll link those down below. But basically, I enjoyed both of these books a lot, but for very different reasons. So Buddenbrooks is a very long, heavy, serious German text. Um, it's called Buddenbrooks, The Decline of a Family, so that's kind of the main premise. It's just a few generations of this family and things just just get worse and worse for them. So if you enjoy that kind of tragic thing, definitely check out Buddenbrooks. And Père Goriot, on the other hand, is like a short and fast-paced, zippy French novel. It's a very fun page turner. We've got a father with these really ungrateful children, and it's also an indictment of high society in Paris in the early 1800s, and this novel was a lot of fun. So I would recommend both of these ones. Another German author that I got around to checking out this month was E.T.A. Hoffman. This collection is called The Golden Pot and Other Tales. So he is well known for being a German writer in the romantic tradition. And he wrote these kind of wild and fabulous short stories. And he appealed to a lot of artsy folk, such as the composer Robert Schumann and a young Dostoevsky. So I thought I had to finally get around to reading him and I had a lot of fun. So I know that he's well known for writing a lot of weird and scary stories, but this collection focused more on his modern interpretation of fairy tales and they were a lot of fun they were all over the place they were kind of confusing at times there were all these like doubles going on there were parallel stories happening in this like magical universe I can honestly say that I never knew what to expect when I turned the page for each of these stories like you just never knew if a character was gonna fall in love with a snake that sings to them or if they were gonna get trapped in a bottle or if they were gonna walk away and turn into a kite or if they were gonna befriend a magical little flea who's really intelligent. So there is a lot of cute and fun things going on in these stories. I'd like to check out some of his other stories on the more darker, weird side, because I really enjoyed the creepiest one in here, The Sandman. So yeah, this is a great introduction to this author and I'm looking forward to reading more. So everything else that I have to talk about in this video is Russian literature. If you watched my Friday Read video, you know that I started this beastly biography of Dostoevsky. I made it about 100 pages into this one, so one tenth of the way done. But I spent a lot of time examining Dostoevsky's early life, and I was especially interested in what some of the formative works were that he read that inspired him as an author. So there were two authors that I really felt I had to familiarize myself with. So I read The Collected Tales of Nikolai Gogol. I've already read Dead Souls and it was awesome. But these tales were, you know, pretty good. There were some mixed results, I'd say. Uh, the first half of this collection are called the Ukrainian tales. So these are fun and lighthearted and had these weird supernatural elements. But I definitely preferred the second half of this book that contained the Petersburg tales. Some of my favorites were The Nose, which where this guy wakes up without a nose and sees his nose off living this active life without him. I also liked The Portrait about this demon 
woman that lives in this painting and he makes artists better for a time but then totally destroys their soul. That one was fun. I also really liked the overcoat even though it's so sad. It's about uh, this man who works in a civil service and he's basically a huge loser at his uh, job. Everyone kind of makes fun of him. He's basically Toby from The Office and he's so poor and he's finally saves up his money to buy this overcoat and just like tragic things happen and it's a really heart-wrenching story. But my favorite one in here was one called Nevsky Prospect, which basically the moral of this story is don't follow random women home because that's what happens. These two friends split up and they each chase after a girl. One of them's a brunette, one's a blonde, and it basically ends up throwing their lives into different kind of tailspins. So that one was a lot of fun. The other author that was super important to young Dostoevsky and to every Russian ever was obviously Alexander Pushkin, so I decided to reread his famous novel in verse Eugene Onegin. It's such a fantastic story. Eugene is this dandy who's so bored of life, and he moves to the countryside, and this Russian chick Tatyana falls in love with him, and you know, things go wrong like they always do, but it's a really interesting story kind of about the Western influences in Russian society. You could say Eugene is really influenced by French culture and he kind of represents those new Western ideas coming through where Tatiana, who is cool as hell, is Russian to the core and she's dramatic and introverted and I really like her, so this is a fun love story. I also read this collection called The Complete Prose of Alexander Pushkin. And I found after reading this, I got a good sense of what life was like in quite a few places in Russia in the 1800s. So there are some stories that are set in the city, there are some that are set on estates, so you learn about what life was like in these country places for landowners and their serfs, as well as there's quite a few stories set in different locations, more on the eastern end of Russia, which I hadn't really read about before. Quite a few of these stories are about Russian colonialism and the different conflicts that the Russian army had with people living in these eastern lands who weren't on board with the Russian agenda so there's some good tales about these rebellions and uprisings and I kind of found myself on the side of the rebels in a lot of cases because that European attitude of superiority is so irritating you know they just call these people heathens and savages and don't really view them as sophisticated people in any means as well there's quite a bit of casual anti-semitism in these books like there's one scene where these two soldiers are joking around and talking about how you need to have hobbies because as they say what are you gonna do with yourself you can't beat Jews all the time so yeah cringing at some of that stuff I found that in Gogol as well so that was a little bit on the problematic side but still, there's lots to enjoy in this collection. They're kind of fun, cutesy stories. They always have these satisfying conclusions. The plots always wrap up really nicely. My favorite stories in this collection were the tales of the late Ivan Petrovich Belkin, who was a fictitious author that uh, Pushkin made up to write about these vignettes of life in a small town in Russia. I also enjoyed The Queen of Spades, which is a story about gambling and it has a ghost. And I also enjoyed Dubrovsky, which is about a son whose father gets cheated off of his land and he turns into this robber slash Robin Hood figure and uh, gets justice in his own way. My favorite thing that I read by Pushkin this month was a poem that I found in my portable 19th century Russian reader, very handy dandy volume, and that one was called The Bronze Horseman. So it's a poem that deals with the creation of the city of St. Petersburg out of this swampland, and it's also about a great flood that happens in the city. So there's a lot of themes about how nature is always going to triumph over civilization. As well, the main character in this is a guy whose fiance drowns in the flood so he's very bitter and he goes up to this great bronze statue of Peter the Great and you know yells at the statue and the horse comes to life and tramples him to death so it was a really great ambiguous ending. Did he die because he questioned the Tsar and you shouldn't do that because the Tsar is always right? Or is it maybe asking a question about whether those who have all the power are perhaps responsible for the destruction of those without power? 
asked a lot of provocative questions. After catching up on my Gogol and Pushkin, I felt ready to finally start Dostoevsky's first novel, Poor Folk. So this is an epistolatory novel. It takes place between this old guy and this young girl, and they are kind of forgotten by society. They kind of exist on the fringes. They're very poor people, but they have found this friendship with each other. So they write these letters and really share their lives and experiences with each other. It's a little bit of like a creepy relationship because this guy is a lot older and kind of giving money to this young girl. So it's a little unsettling, but ultimately I think it's supposed to be a beautiful connection. This is a story about two very real people and there's nothing very glamorous or exciting about them. There's not really much of a plot in this novel, it's kind of them just going about their day-to-day -day lives. In the Dostoevsky biography that I'm reading, Joseph Frank writes about how this is a perfect combination of Gogol and Pushkin in that Dostoevsky's writing about a lot of the things that Gogol is in the overcoat. He's talking about people that are downtrodden and kind of forgotten about by society, but he does so with a lot more compassion than Gogol does, who often has this satirical tone in his writing. He takes that element of compassion and making us really care for these people that you can find in Pushkin, and he combines them into a way that is totally his own, and you can see why this was an important literary debut. There were a few other early Dostoevsky stories included in this collection, but I'm not going to talk about them because I can't say that I liked them very much. So Poor Folk I thought was a pretty strong debut, but he was obviously writing a lot of crap at the time as well, so I'm excited to watch him grow and progress as he becomes a better writer throughout his works. So those were all the books that I read in April. I also got about 500 pages into The Tin Drum by Gunter Grass, but alas, I was not able to finish by the end of this month. So we will talk about this book at another time when I finish. It is so weird. I don't know what to make of this thing. Anyway, um, please let me know what you read this month, and I hope you all have a great reading month in May.